Hello again, everyone. Today I'm going to be doing another swatching of a travel palette. Today's travel palette is this whiskey palette, which I have filled completely with Daniel Smith colors. I have a little tiny color chart here, and you can see I've already been <laughs> mixing these up a bit and painting with them, and some of the colors are a little bit muddy already. I'm going to try and clean those off as we go. So uh, I've already taken the watercolor paper out of my traveler's notebook where I'm keeping all of these swatches and I'm going to put a link to this notebook below so that you can see the setup and how this all works. I will also put a link to the previous swatching videos so that you can see these all in a series if you would like. Otherwise just feel free to watch today and we'll get to it. So I've already open this up here to the page that we're going to be doing today and this is the one we're going to be doing today. The last one was also a whiskey palette that came from Schmincke as a pre-organized uh, color palette but I added some some additional colors. This was a slightly different whiskey palette so I encourage you to go check out that video if you'd like to see a different whiskey palette. The whiskey palette is just really a brand name for a sort of smallish palette that is smaller than a standard palette. So let's see, do I, yeah, let me show you the difference in palette size. So this is a standard palette. This one is from Meaden that I got from Amazon and I just put a little sticker on the front there. Of course there's some dog fur on that. <laughs> so this is a standard palette and I'm going to close up this one and show you the difference. So this one is you put it on top it's let's say maybe two-thirds of the size you can definitely tell a huge difference in the um, width of the palette itself so it's really handy for and I was just going to kind of show you the top here so it doesn't have as many mixing areas that is a downside so when it's open this one has this additional flap which also serves as additional mixing area. And then this one just has the one mixing area with two uh, wells up at the top. This one also only has two wells up at the top, but obviously they're larger. The Schmincke palette that I use as my regular travel palette that I, that I take around most places has three mixing wells on the top. So that's really nice to have that extra room. But this one is great if you do not have a lot of space and it will hold 12 colors, which is quite a bit. Sorry, I have the label for that other one there. Um, which is quite a bit for such a small package. Now, I did want to show you how I have these colors set up in here, because you'll notice my, my uh, half pans, which is what this is filled with, are not filled all the way to the top. What I have done is I have put little dollops of watercolor over here, because I'm right-handed and I usually hold the palette like this, there is a little, here I'll close it and turn it upside down. So there is a little thumb ring here. I don't generally use this because I find it slightly uncomfortable when I use it, but you could either slip your finger or your thumb like that into the back and then open it up like this. So I would hold it like this with the mixing area up here. You could also hold it the other way around, but this is generally how I hold it, which is why I put the paints in here this way. So they're angled at an angle here. So when I come in with a paintbrush, which I already have handy here, this is my Miller's Pseudo Sable number four, the one I'm using for all of the swatches in this book. If I put it in here, I can brush up against the color this way and it will not damage the tip of the brush. It will essentially get paint into the entire brush without having to jab at it with the tip. So this is one of the few palettes that I have set up right now like this where with the angled uh, watercolors in there, it, but it does work really well. The only problem is you're gonna have less watercolor in your pans, obviously, but it does help to preserve your brushes if that is a concern for you. So I'm just flipping up that little thumb ring in the back there. And this has the little whiskey palette logo on the back. Okay, and with that, let's go ahead and start swatching. And I'll go through what these colors are when we get there. I'm going to put a little bit of water onto each well. Um, and you'll notice this one, I actually have a tiny little dollop of a different color 
for this yellow here. I basically wanted to have an additional medium, um, medium, I was gonna say medium weight, medium darkness uh, yellow that, to add to this. So I just put a tiny little bit here. Uh, that might not be permanent in here. I just had it there because I was playing with it when I was painting but I will figure out how to account for that in my swatches. Okay, just put a little dab of water on each of these. And I do have to watch out because sometimes if I dab the color too hard, it immediately starts wetting and already gets on my brush and then I contaminate the next color that I'm going into, so I'm trying not to do that. Okay, so that's really all you need. These don't require a lot of wetting. So let's just go ahead and get started. I'm gonna put it this way and you'll be able to see the palette. I'm going to wipe off this mixing area too because we are gonna be using that at the end. And these clean off really, really easily and generally don't stain too much. There, there is a little bit of staining you can see in there but they're usually pretty easy to clean. So once I'm done swatching, we're gonna to go to this little triad mixing, mixing chart here. I'm not gonna talk about those colors yet, I'll talk about them at the end and why I chose the ones that I did there. So let's go ahead and, let's see if I have it that way, you probably can see it. I just realized that I had this zoomed in from the very beginning. I was wondering why my traveler's notebook didn't really fit into the frame. It's because I had this zoomed in to, go, to swatch the watercolors. Okay, so these are all Daniel Smith colors. This is Sap Green. I really love Daniel Smith's Sap Green. It's a beautiful color. And as if you watch the prior videos, you'll, you'll know the drill, but if you haven't, I will say it again. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the paint full strength at the top here and then watering it down a little bit to get a sort of a gradation from top to bottom and then I'm watering it down a little bit more for each of these squares so that I can see what different variations I can get with this one color. And as per usual, this is really just a fraction of the colors that you can get or the tones that you can get from this one color. But it should give me at least a little bit of an idea where it's coming from. Because I have some mixed color there, I'm just gonna take from the portion of the color here that does not have any of that blue mixed in. So this is a Hansa Yellow Medium. Hansa Yellow Medium is a really good color if you plan to only have one yellow on your palette because it's sort of in the middle of light to dark yellows and it, make, it mixes to make really nice colors. And yellows generally don't have a lot of variation from um, saturated to, to less saturated. You're gonna get similar colors down the line and here it's like virtually virtually no pigment at all okay I will handle that little doll up there at the end I'll figure out where I want to put that and label it so this one here is new gamboge which is a more orangey yellow it's kind of in between orange and yellow but it is um, actually this is no longer a single pigment. I was going to say it was a single pigment paint. It used to be, but I think that they ran out of access to that single pigment that would give you this color. So then they started making it with two different pigments. I don't have the pigment numbers on my swatch, otherwise I would tell you. But that is easily looked up. Daniel Smith has a really great website where it goes into detail for each of the colors here that they have in their line. They have, they have all the information for all of their colors. Okay, so then the next one is Quinacridone Gold. And Quinacridone Gold is a color that I use a lot and really like. I often will use it as my warm yellow on my palette. This is another color that used to be single pigment and then I think that that resource actually just ran out, like it just became no longer available anywhere. And so now it is a two pigment color, but it's still really beautiful. And just because someone something is a two pigment color 
does not necessarily mean that it's bad. Uh, nor does it mean that you'll be more likely to create mud when you mix. I, uh, I, I know that there is this thought out there, and it's not necessarily incorrect, that the more, pigment, more pigments you mix together, the more likely you are to get mud. And really when that is a danger is if you have something, say, um, say a green that's a yellow and a blue mixed, and then you mix that green with, a, with red and, and a whole bunch of other different colors that aren't similar, you, you, will, you could get mud. Although with, I've, I've actually found with artist grade colors, it's very unlikely to get mud unless you really try at it. But um, if you have a pigment that is two, or a color that is two pigments, like this Quin Gold or New Gamboge, they're both yellow. Both of the pigments in there are yellow pigments. So if you mix yellow, these two yellows with a variety of blues or something, you're always gonna get a variant of green. You're not gonna get mud. So it's really just mixing colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel that'll give you mud. Um, and then it won't always give you mud because sometimes you may want to tone down a color. So you will mix a little bit of a color that's on the opposite side of the color wheel. Going into a little bit of color theory here. I wasn't necessarily planning to. Um, so if you want to dull down a color, you'd mix, you'd mix just a little bit of a color opposite on the color wheel and you'd actually get a more muted or neutral tone. So not necessarily mud. And you know some shades of mud are not bad. <laughs> so this one was cobalt teal. Sorry, I didn't say that. It's a lovely, lovely light blue teal. I love it. This next one is cerulean blue chromium, which is a. Uh, it's. I'm not sure if it's the same pigment number as just plain cerulean blue. It might be. I'd have to double check that but it uh, is more saturated than just regular cerulean blue because they do have two separate pigments. They have this one, which is a cerulean blue chromium. We're all talking Daniel Smith here. And then they have the just regular cerulean blue, and that one is a little bit harder to wet and is not as saturated. And you can get similar mixes though with them, and I tend to like the more saturated version. I tend to like the more saturated versions of everything, <laughs> if I'm going to be honest. The only unsaturated color that I use regularly is Potter's Pink, and that is mostly because of its granulation effect and how you can kind of add granulation to anything with that. Okay, okay, here's a really good example of how I mess up my mixing charts. So, this was supposed to be French Ultramarine, but I skipped that in my palette and went to Lunar Blue, which is the one next to it. So what I'm gonna, do, I'll show you how I correct that here at the end. But this is Lunar Blue, not French Ultramarine. And I've always said on this channel that it's hard for me to multitask. So talking and painting or concentrating on other things at the same time is hard for me. And then I always talk. I just don't shut up, right? So, because um, I feel like when I go through here, I have so much to tell you all. Okay, so let's make sure we do French Ultramarine for the next one, even though we skipped it. And then, like I said, I'll show you how I correct that. Okay, so I'm going to go into French Ultramarine. French Ultramarine, or some variant of Ultramarine, is almost, not almost, it is always on my palette. I used to think, oh, well, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that color by itself, but I actually have become more of a fan of the color by itself, and I like to use it for skies, for one thing, like really deep, saturated blue skies. But also, it is a fantastic mixing color. It mixes great with a variety of things. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish out the chart and then correct that. So we're going on to the bottom row here, and this first one is Perlene Red. And so you'll see that I do have, or at least I made an attempt to do the split primary 
system here where I have at least one cool and one warm of each of the primaries. So this particular red skews a little bit cooler, this perylene red, than the next one I'm going to put on here. And so I would consider my French Ultramarine my warm blue, and then I would consider my Cerulean Blue Chromium my cool blue, and Hansi Yellow Medium is, in this case, the cooler of my yellows. You know, it's, it's always kind of relative to what you have in your palette. And then either the new Gamboge or the Quin Gold could be my um, warm yellow. I could also just consider the new Gamboge my warm yellow and consider Quin Gold one of my earth colors. Um, it really just depends on how you want to classify it and how you use it when you're mixing. So this next color is Deep Scarlet, which I would consider warmer red. And if you're listening to me talking and you're thinking, I have no idea what she's talking about, I just don't get it, and it's a little too advanced, or you just didn't get enough information, first off, you can ask questions below, always, and I will try to get to your comment as soon as possible. And, or you can um, just ignore my comments. <laughs> I mean, or not ignore my comments, but ignore what I'm talking about. You could also just turn down the volume entirely uh, it's really up to you. This is your YouTube channel as you're watching it, so feel free to do what you want. Some people have asked me to do non-chatty videos with music, um, although I liked that idea uh, because I'm all for some meditative swatching for especially, and this is burnt sienna by the way, um, but I just, I haven't really found any music that I could play that would be copyright free that I like enough to do that. Um, maybe if you all have some sources for that, that you might like to hear, let me know. But for the time being, I don't think I'll be doing that, but you always have the option of turning down the volume or off the volume, as it may be. So this next one is Lunar Red Rock, and this is a very opaque color, for one, and it's very granulating. This could be used as a replacement for something like a um, an Earth Red. I think this is a fairly new color to Daniel Smith's line, but I really like it. I really like granulating colors. I think some people are, um, okay. Hello again. So I had to cut this video up into two segments because I received a call in the middle. So you didn't get the very end of my swatching of the Lunar Red Rock, but here is the final version. I was talking about granulation and how people, some people don't necessarily like granulation because they think it's a little muddy. I like it just because it gives a lot of texture. I think that should catch us up from where the video stopped. So I am now going to correct this mistake that I made here before I go on to the color chart. So I need to find, oh, I should have done that while I was um, on my little break there. But luckily I found it right away. So I usually use a correction tape in a little um, package like this. And let's see, make sure I'm using the right side. And then I will go over these colors. Color names. And then I usually kind of brush it a little bit so that it's smushed down into the paper. Okay. So I changed, I got rid of those two color names, and now I'm going to take the pen that is in my traveler's notebook that holds this, go and, and get the blue pen out of here, and then relabel them. So this is Lunar Blue. And this one is Ultramarine. It's actually French ultramarine blue. OK, 
Okay, and then I'm gonna make a little indication that these are reversed in the palette. So that's all I do. I try to keep it low stress with the swatches because I don't want to uh, stress out about it and it's supposed to be a fun thing. And when I go back in and I make these little notes for myself, as long as I'm fairly consistent, I'm not gonna forget you know, what, what I did or, or what where it is in my palette because I can also look at my palette. So now I'm going to go on to the uh, little mixing chart here. So I'll first talk about the colors that I chose and why. So for the blue, I chose Cerulean Blue Chromium. For the red, I chose Deep Scarlet. For the yellow, I chose Hansa Yellow Medium. So basically the reason why I chose all of these colors is because they're not necessarily a standard triad of primaries. Um, this one's a little bit different than what you would see in, in a just pure blue. This one's a little darker and different than what you would see in a pure red in a, in a um, triad mixing chart. The Hansi Yellow Medium is probably a little more, the most standard of the three, but I also kind of wanted to see how these colors would mix. So let's just go ahead and get down to it and see how it goes. So I always start with the red because the red is on the top. And I'm going to move this down so I can use my um, mixing area here. So I'm going to use the red, which is the red scarlet. I'm sorry, deep scarlet. Ooh, oh, I'm being so messy. It's because I'm working around my palette here so that you can see the colors while I'm painting. And sometimes, no, it's not wet enough. Sometimes if it's wet enough, you can kind of push it back in with, with your finger, but it's not here. So I may go back and correct that, maybe not. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that red here to my palette. And then I am going to rinse that off. And then I'm gonna do the yellow, which is the Hansa Yellow Medium, which is here. Oh, and I forgot I, that I never dealt with that little dollop of paint. We'll deal with that too. So here's the yellow, Hansa Yellow Medium. This is really one of my favorite yellows. It's a very beautiful yellow. Okay, and so now I'm going to mix that yellow roughly 50-50, doing my best to mix 50-50 with this deep scarlet. And then we have our orange that goes in the middle here. Okay, and now that I have that puddle there, I am going to mix a little bit of yellow with one half here, so I can get a more yellow orange to go here. Move that out a little bit. Again, this is a little bit of an awkward angle for my hand. And then I'm gonna rinse again, dip into the deep scarlet, put a little bit, and then mix with the other half of this orange to get a more red-leaning orange. Yeah. Dab that to get a little more. Okay. So now I'm gonna wipe that off my palette. I'm gonna get a little bit of water on my tissue here. I can get a clean area. Okay, and then we're using Cerulean Blue Chromium for the blue. So let me make sure I get that in the right pan. And Cerulean Blue Chromium, I believe, is a granulating color as well. So you will get, you will get a little bit of um, separation potentially when you mix. And again, when you're working on a painting, that's something that you look for and like. Or at least some people do. I do. So, oh, I should have put some on my palette here. So let me go ahead and put some of that blue on my palette. And then I'm going to start with the red mix at the top. So I'm going to get an equal amount of the um, red, although it looks like I might have a little bit too much red because that's a very red purple. Okay, I'm going to dab off my brush a little bit. Go back and get a little more blue. Okay, that's more. So you're not gonna get a bright, vivid purple with these two mixed together because they're a little bit 
um, well the red's pretty dark for one and you've got the granulation and the just the tone of the cerulean is going to give you a different different feel so I'm going to mix a little bit of red up here at the top to get a purplish red okay and then put that here And then I'm going to mix the blue up here and get a sort of bluish purple. And you'll see that that doesn't necessarily look like a bluish purple, it almost looks like a gray. And when you're using non-standard primaries, you're gonna get results like that. And so sometimes it's fun to play and see what colors you can get when you're doing that. Okay, I'm gonna rinse this out again, or wipe this out again. And then we're gonna do the last one. So cerulean blue chromium again. I'm gonna put that in my palette there. And then I'm gonna mix an equal amount of the yellow. And that gets you a really nice green. screen. Okay, and as before, I'm going to add a little bit of blue to one side to get a bluish green. And then I'm going to add a little bit more of the yellow to the other side to get a yellowish green. Okay, so I'm gonna have to hurry up because I have to. I have a text I need to respond to here. So, um, and now I'm gonna mix this red with these. And again, the red is pretty intense. So I'm gonna have to add a little bit more of the two. This is to get the neutral in the middle. So that is almost already a little yellow brown. That would be a really nice color on its own. And then mix blue. Now we're going a little too green. It's sometimes hard to get the mix right to get your neutral. And now that's leaning a little red. It's getting close though. And I think that's probably good with that extra blue. And so this is going to be our neutral in the middle, mixing the three primaries. Okay, so there we go. And oh, and to add this little doll up here, what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna create its own square. I'm actually going to put a little circle here and then label that separately. And that is Grumbacher Cadmium Yellow Medium. Just going to abbreviate it. Grum, cad, yellow, medium. Okay, so then that is an accurate representation of what is in my palette. And if I ever want to get rid of that dollop, I could just do what I did here with the lettering and go over it with the correction tape at a later point. Sorry, that's a little too high. Okay. So that's it for today. Feel free to like and or subscribe and I'll see you next time with another swatching video or next time might not be a swatching video, but either way, I hope to see you there. All right, have a great day. Thanks, bye.